Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today for Lunch in Pompeii, a speaker series brought to you by the College of Sciences at the University of Central Florida and in partnership with the Orlando Science Center. My name is Brandon Landman. I'm the Vice President of Visitor Experience for the Orlando Science Center and I'm very excited to present to you Pompeii, the Immortal City. Every five years or so, the Science Center brings in a blockbuster exhibit to bring to our community and to have exciting opportunities to learn about cultures, science, technologies from around the world. Pompeii is the perfect experience for these times. Timed entry creates limited capacity for our exhibit experience. On top of that, we also have ample space in our 10,000 square foot exhibit hall for you to wander and explore all the amazing artifacts that you're gonna find. We chose Pompeii the Immortal City because of the amazing stories that it has. And its connection to today is just more relevant than you would ever know. The science, the technology, the engineering, the mathematics, the STEM content that takes place in Rome and Italy 2,000 years ago is so relevant to today, from urban planning, to plumbing, to glass working, to metal working, to measurements, it's all there. And we get to learn from that experience and explore that experience in detail that you've never seen before. Pompeii the Immortal City is funded in part by Orange County government through the Arts and Cultural Affairs Blockbuster Program and its tourism partners. Thanks to their support, we were able to bring this once in a lifetime experience to our community and were able to offer free admission to our members. Pompeii will be with us until January 24th, 2021. We're the final stop in the United States. You won't be able to see this at any other time. I mean, unless you go to Italy. So stop in, get your tickets, enjoy the experience and come explore the amazing Pompeii, the Immortal City. Thank you for your support and enjoy today's presentation. Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our second lunch in Pompeii presented by UCF College of Sciences and Orlando Science Center. My name is Jesse Zito and I'm the Director of Programs here at Orlando Science Center. We're excited to offer this program and I'm happy to see the response we've gotten for the speaker series. On October 26, Orlando Science Center officially opened Pompeii, the Immortal City, which is one of the most beautiful and engaging exhibits that I've seen before. I'd encourage everyone to visit Orlando Science Center for your chance to see these incredible artifacts up close. Today's presentation will be followed by a Q&A session, so stick around to the end. You're welcome to submit questions during the presentation using the Q&A feature below. The Q&A is also where you'll find a link for any students that need credit for attending. Today, we have a fascinating presentation from Dr. Lena Williams. Dr. Williams is a bioarchaeologist specializing in research of human health and diet. She received her PhD in 2008 from University of Western Ontario and was awarded the Governor General's Academic Gold Medal in 2009. She has been a member of the Dakla Oasis Project in Egypt since 2002, the Catholic University in Louvain, Belgium Project at Deir al Bashar. Uh, Barsha in Egypt since two, 2006, and also works with various archaeological projects in Europe, the Near East, and Mesoamerica. The central goal of Dr. Williams's research, <clears throat> excuse me, the central goal of Dr. Williams's research is to better understand the synergistic complexities among biological, social, and physical environments in the past. She focuses particularly on isotopic and elemental analysis of hair, seasonality, and fertility and disease musculoskeletal biomechanics and patterns of activity, and placement of the dead in the physical and social landscapes. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, I'm really happy to introduce Dr. Williams. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm very excited for your talk, and I'm ready whenever you're ready. You're welcome to take it away, okay? All right, that sounds great, Jesse, thank you. All right, first I wanna thank you for such a warm welcome and special thanks to the Orlando Science Center for inviting me to share with you a taste of Pompeii today. Our system of tastes that seem so naturally preferable to us are very different from those of the past. A perfect meal of ancient Pompeii was one where all the tastes and therefore all the virtues would be simultaneously present. But these tastes developed a cuisine based on the blending of multitudes of flavors and textures rather than being kind of singular, distinct. 
the structure of taste really strongly correlated with the philosophy and the worldview of those living in Pompeii. They were at a crossroads of trade, religion, social interaction, and politics. However, at times, the structure of taste also serves as a barrier for us in a lot of our ways of understanding a reality that's so different from our own. Food is one way that humans define themselves. Every group thinks of itself as being special and exceptional, and we use our food to show it. One French identity is, of course, connected with fresh white bread, while most Southern Italians might insist on tomato sauce. But this identification can also take the form of a negative at times in foods that are excluded. The concepts of we don't eat that, they eat that. But what we think of and recognize as wonderfully delicious food is actually a very slippery concept because it's very much in the eye of the beholder. Now along the top from left to right, we have still life images of a hen and some veal, two cuttlefish, a bird, some snails and lobster and a hare and a duck. Along the bottom, we have chicken, partridge, pomegranates, apples, even thrushes and mushrooms, and finally more partridges and some eels. If there's one thing that we've learned about the Pompeians through archeology span so far, is that they did not waste food. They used and consumed everything that was edible from organ meats to stale bread to wheat bran and even fish guts. If food or drink could be made from it, the Romans as a whole would find a way and what better connection can we actually make with them as ordinary people than through their food and drink? The Romans actually inherited the majority of their culinary ideas from other cultures. Just as an empire absorbed land across the Mediterranean, the Romans themselves also were enthusiastic consumers of customs and traditions. And they successfully incorporated the practices and a lot of the foodstuffs of their conquered peoples. But the surprising extent of culinary imports came from the far reaches of the empire, including olives and dates from the Near East and even pepper from India. There's a whole range of plants and animals that were brought from every corner and basically presented at Caesar's table. And excavation finds in Pompeii's kitchens even include sea urchins from the Red Sea, flamingos from the coastal regions of Southern Spain, and even a butchered leg joint of a giraffe from Central Africa. Now their tombs contained panels that were decorated with the images of food and drink, and even offerings of artificial terracotta foods, including pomegranates, grapes, figs, and even focaccia bread. In Pompeii, we find the remains of food offered to household gods, things like nuts, fruits, eggs, and animal bones. And private offerings to the gods and feasting with the dead were practices which had become woven into their daily life. The fertile location of the city and its surroundings really rewarded Pompeii with an abundance of produce. There were some 80 farms and vineyards around the town itself. And as much as 20% of Pompeii was under cultivation in kitchen gardens and even small vineyards, many of which served the citizens and the numerous bars and restaurants. Now this served the citizens at all levels, but perhaps especially those with modest homes and had little space for food preparation themselves. In homes of the wealthier Pompeians, we find that the kitchens were never really visited by the master and their family. Instead, slaves would actually tend the hearth and prepare food using an array of different vessels and utensils, many of which are familiar to modern cooks. Things like steam cookers, colanders, strainers, even animal-shaped molds and baking trays. We find pestles and mortars and portable ovens for al fresco cooking. They've all been excavated from the kitchens of Pompeii. Another thing we know about the Pompeians, of course, is that they used grapes to make wine. They were prolific winemakers and even had multiple uses for the grape pulp and the skins that are known as grape must. The grapes also provided them with an enjoyable fruit that consumed fresh or preserved by drying for consumption. And vineyards are found in town, but also in country. Most grapes were pressed with a wine press, but some were pressed by foot. And generally, wine appears to have been brought in from the countryside when needed. The villas in the country had large rooms for pressing the grapes for fermentation and also for storage. The large wine jars were buried completely or partially in the ground for protection for weather and storage. And when needed, it was transported to the towns in large leather wineskins. 
And most famous local wines were Vesuvinum and Pompeianum. Pliny the Elder, in his work Natural History from 77 AD, really discusses the potency of Pompeian wine. And he states that the wines are rather dangerous and can have a cause of a headache. Now, Pasca was made by watering down the low quality wine that almost tasted like vinegar and also adding honey, herbs, and spices. The recent studies have shown that Pasca was actually quite healthy for us. It was full of antioxidants and vitamin C and the coriander seeds had health benefits. Because it was quite acid, given that sour vinegar taste, it also killed all of the bacteria in the water. Because keep in mind, the water back then was not exactly clean. One use for that grape must in Roman kitchens was a preparation of a grape reduction syrup known as defrutum. Now, this was used in the preservation of fruit and wine, but it was also used as a sauce and a colorant for a lot of different meat dishes. The grape must was also baked into breads, such as the panis mustacesius, what you see here. This is a small, unleavened, sweet, and kind of savory wheat cake that also included spices and cheese. Now, bread was the backbone of Pompey's daily diet. The fresco that you see here is the distribution of bread from the house of the baker. And it shows a counter filled with a great number of loaves of bread in various shapes piled on top of each other. The man in the white tunic is offering a loaf of bread to one of the three people in all in short traveling clothes. Now this scene has been interpreted as the sale of bread, the private donation of bread, but also a baker elected to hold a public office. But no matter the real reason, this event is really interesting because it permits the close association of the types of bread depicted with those actually found at Pompeii, like the example you see here on the right. This is a preserved loaf of what's called panis quadratus, or the bread of fours. It's named after the four linear cuts made to the loaf prior to baking, creating eight evenly distributed sections. Most bread at the time was baked in community ovens. So customized stamps like the ones shown here were used to mark individual families, but also the bakery's loaves. Under Roman law, bread was regulated commodity and everything from the cost to the size was controlled. And selling underweight loaves could warrant a penalty. And since bakery loaves were also often stamped, if the bread was found to be of poor quality, the authorities really knew who to blame. This could also be particularly important in cases where bread was being distributed to the people as a political act. You know who paid for the bread, so hopefully you would support that person in office. The loaf of the bread on the right was found in the nearby town of Herculaneum. It was also preserved under the ash from Mount Vesuvius eruption. Now, this loaf is stamped with the text of Sealer, slave of Quintus Granius Verus. Now, the bread's original owner, the sealer, is known to have survived the eruption of Vesuvius and also the subsequent pyroclastic flow because his name appears in later lists of freed slaves. Much of what we know about the bread quality and the manufacturing process also comes from the writing of Pliny the Elder. He describes a lot of the various kinds of wheat that are imported from even the farthest reaches of the empire and identifies the color and the special qualities of each type of grain. So depending on the quality of bread, you may have flour meals that were mixed with millet, spelt, barley, and bread wheat, which for the highest quality of breads was coming from the fine emmer wheat of Egypt. And for leavening, small cakes of millet or barley grain and grape must were soaked in fresh water and then boiled with flour to the consistency of porridge and then left till it began to turn sour or ferment. The dough was then left to rise and when portioned and formed into seven or eight inch rounds that were weighing about three pounds each. Now forming pans were used to control the spread of the dough before baking. And the groove that you see around the edge of the loaf is actually not from the pan. It's from a tied fiber that was burned away during the baking process. This basically would have kept the loaf from spreading too quickly in the oven and losing its shape during baking. This also kept all of the loaves in a very uniform shape and size. The exterior of the bread would have been a darker brown with the inside crumb, that nice lighter tone, and the density of the crumb would have been less than the crust, 
having those cavities that we see that are similar to a lot of our modern leavened breads. Bread was a critical commodity at Pompeii. It required massive quantities of grain, firewood, and slave and animal labor to produce a daily supply to feed about 12,000 people. The donkeys walked in circles tirelessly, rotating the grain mills. And when animal labor wasn't possible, the process was dependent on slave labor. Now, the grinding took place between the two parts, the conical base called the meta, and on top of that, a stone that was shaped like an hourglass. The donkeys were attached to a wooden frame over the top stone and grain was poured into the open hopper at the top. Now these two parts were separated by a very small fixed distance. So if the distance was too small, the grain would actually burn during grinding. But if it was too large, too much bran would have actually remained. And that meal from the grinding was collected in a terracotta tray that rested on the circular stone base. The ovens were fired around the clock and enough grain had to be imported from within the region or from provincially confiscated territories to supply the people with their daily bread. And remember, the Roman grain supply also ensured control over the population under a really good slogan, Panum et Circenses, bread and circuses. Now, modern bakers like to experiment with recipes and they've reconstructed these loaves in many forms. The ones shown here were produced by Farrell Monaco. She's a well-respected authority on culinary archeology span and the author of the blog, Tavola Mediterranea. Now the overall flavor and texture and color of the bread was dependent on the types of grain. But for the most part, these loaves had a slight sour taste, similar to the sourdoughs we have today. And the crust had kind of a nutty, toasty taste and aroma. It moderately grain textures like our bakery, fresh whole wheat breads today. Some of the heartier breads considered to be lower in quality had greater amounts of spelt, barley, or millet in them. And they would have been a little bit darker with kind of a rich malty or molasses flavor. Some of the lighter wheat loaves were flavored with herbs and spices like fennel, poppy seeds, coriander, and even parsley. And these loaves were intended to be broken apart and easily used as what you might refer to as an edible eating utensil. They used them to sop up stews, soups, and even pulse mixtures. So these flavors would have been a really welcome addition to these kinds of foods. Underlying a lot of the Roman cooking were pungent fermented fish sauces. The two most popular ones were garum and liquamen. And these were basically, no other way to put it, a unique combination of sea salt and sun. It originated in Greece and was perhaps the ancestor in a very roundabout way to Worcestershire sauce today. The theory is that the Romans exported garum to India in ancient times, and then the British brought it back from India into England about 2,000 years later. But this sauce was a very lucrative export for Pompeii, which was in the hands of a prosperous Pompeian family known as the Imbrici. The quality of the sauce depended on the type of fish that was being used, like tuna, mackerel, and even moray eel for the more expensive varieties. And the anchovies for the coarser type were used and sold in bars to firm the towns. Now, the mosaic of garum jar that you see on the right is from the house of Ambrosia Scarus. And the stopper at the top of the amphora indicates that it was produced for trade because the stopper seals and preserves in the best state of taste and consistency. Now, Ambrosia Scarus was very good at his job. He owned at least six workshops that produced garum. And about 30% of the containers all the way through the Campania region carry his name for that of his extended family. And interestingly, the basket that you see here on the other side is preserved remains of fish that was used in garum production. And that's what's actually helped archeologists at this site more accurately date Vesuvius's eruption. Now slaves and laborers made this aromatic fish sauce by really chopping up whole fish, including their guts and tossing them into large clay pots with varied amounts of salt and sometimes herbs like oregano. Also in a lot of the quality batches, some small whole fish, especially smelts and tiny mullet were used. Once packed, the container was placed in the sun for at least two months or more. And frequently it was turned. So the salt loving bacteria from the fish's guts could break down the flesh. And after it had aged in the heat, the garum was extracted by taking a long thickly woven basket like the one we just saw and placing it in the vat full of liquefied rotted fish. 
The garum enters the basket, much like a bucket in a water barrel, and the liquamen is strained through the basket and retrieved. The remaining sediment is called alec, and this was tightly pressed in wine presses to retrieve a very thick, viscous, kind of low quality sauce that was used in the lowest classes of bars in Pompeii. Now, even for the Pompeians, the smell of garum during the process of fermentation was said to be so terrible that the common folk were actually outlawed from making it in their own homes. The factories where garum was produced in Pompeii haven't been found yet. And this perhaps indicates that due to the smell, they were situated outside the walls of the city. Now, the finished garum product is a little bit like the consistency of ketchup, and it tastes kind of earthy and slightly tangy. The first hit is really intense salt, but that's quickly overtaken by a full force of a very fishy flavor that's similar to heavy mackerel. But it's that salt that really lingers behind. Many Thai and Vietnamese fish sauces are very similar to garum because they're made quite in the same way. Now, finally, we do have to face the fact that these little critters were most likely a delicious delicacy in Pompeii. Dormice, which in Latin were known as gleese, are quite large rodents similar to small squirrels. They're still present in the wild throughout a good portion of Europe, but in some countries, they're now protected species. Roman villas oftentimes raised edible dormice to be eaten locally or sold as a market uh, product for those who had really expensive tastes. In Rome and also in Pompeii, there was a sumptuary law that was passed in 115 BC that actually forbade the eating of dormice, but no one really paid any attention to it at all because dormice was often on the menu and bred specifically for the table. Now, they were also allowed to live free in fences in gardens. And when dormices hibernate, they become thinner. And the Romans wanted to prevent this because we all know the best dormice are the ones with a good layer of fat. And during the early winter season, they put the dormice into large lidded jars called glaria and buried them half in the ground. These rodents were fattened in these vessels with little ledges inside them and holes that were poked through the walls and water could be poured through the top. And they were given chestnuts, walnuts and acorns as food to prevent them from hibernating. A lot of archeological examples of these ceramic vessels have been found at Pompeii and elsewhere in Roman Italy. Now, to follow, these small delicacies are often a part of a starter of a meal. It's referred to as the gustatio. The Apicus, which is a collection of Roman cookery recipes, are thought to have been compiled right around the first century AD. And this contains a recipe for stuffed dormice. It's filled with minced pork and dormouse trimmings, all pounded with pepper, pine kernels, and of course, garum sauce. And then you sew the mouse up and put it on a tile and roast it in the oven. In most instances, they were immediately glazed with honey and rolled in poppy seeds and then served. But today, there's still a small subset of Europeans who eat dormice. In some rural parts of Campania region in Italy, they're served as a stew with polenta. In Croatia, they're stewed, roasted, and even fried. And in Slovenia, on Dvar Island, they host an annual dormouse festival in the summer. Now, I hate to spoil the curiosity of how these actually taste, but the meat has a very delicate texture and a richness that's very similar to wild fowl. So, even the Pompeians, when asked, probably said it tastes like chicken. Um, these days, most people consider edible dormice to actually be a nuisance because they frequently hibernate in attics and non-electrical cables. But to those of us who are scientists, they're a big boon because this species has an extremely long lifespan for its size, around 13 years. And these are used by researchers who are actually studying aging today. So, there's no one food that's consumed by everyone on Earth. Taste is determined by culture, anatomy, and genetics. Almost everything we eat, and when and where, is completely culturally determined. So taste is something that we are taught. In American cultures, serving a plate of roasted and honeyed dormouse at an important occasion might be taken as kind of an insult. While in Pompeii, it was the centerpiece when starting a banquet. So everything we know about the foods we choose, how we cook it, how we eat it, has meaning. 
When thinking of foods that they eat, no matter who they happen to be, take a moment to consider the meaning of who was allowed to fish for it, farm it, mill it, or even kill it. What vessels and utensils were used in preparation, what time of day the meal was eaten, and what order the food was served in, even who serves it, or whether it's hot or cold, cooked in water or by direct fire. So if you get the chance, put yourself at their plate, so to speak. And above all, ignore the warnings of Pliny the Elder. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Williams. That was fascinating. There were several times I had to check to make sure my microphone was off because I kept saying, wow, wow, as I was looking at your pictures. But that was unbelievably interesting. Um, I, I want to point out, I, I thought it was a really interesting fact that you have found, or there have been found, uh, butchered giraffe legs uh, in Pompeii. <laughs> that is fascinating. Um, and I also just wanted to mention to you that this topic, food in Pompeii, has been the most popular topic uh, for the guests that visit the exhibit. We do have one of the preserved loaves of bread, if anyone is interested in seeing that in person, and it has been our favorite thing to talk about in the exhibit. Um, I wanted to thank you very much for an incredible presentation. Thank you for taking the time to join us uh, and share your experience and your expertise. We're gonna be back with Dr. Williams in just a minute. Uh, right now we have a short message from uh, Tasha Dupre, Interim Dean of UCF's College of Sciences and an Orlando Science Center board member. We'll be right back. Hello, I'm Tasha Dupre, the Interim Dean of the College of Sciences at the University of Central Florida. We would like to thank you for virtually attending our Lunch in Pompeii speaker series hosted by the UCF College of Sciences and the Orlando Science Center. We are excited to partner once again with the Orlando Science Center to bring you some very interesting and informative talks given by faculty from our college and educators from the Orlando Science Center. We would like to invite you to join us for the remainder of the talks in this Lunch in Pompeii speaker series. The talks occur once a month through January. Information on the series and the RSVP links for each talk can be found at sciences.ucf.edu slash lunch dash in dash Pompeii. The website link will appear on the closing slide that you will see next. We would like to encourage you to come to the Orlando Science Center and visit this amazing exhibit firsthand. The exhibit will be on display during the Orlando Science Center's normal business hours from October 26th through January 24th. Now please stay online for the question and answer, answer session with our speaker. All right, everybody. So we're back with a chance to have your questions answered by Dr. Williams. I'm gonna start with a few myself, uh, then we'll take some uh, questions from the audience. Remember, you can submit your questions uh, to the, to the Q&A uh, section below, and you can upvote questions that you'd like to see answered. Um, I wanna start off, Dr. Williams, by just talking about the partnership between science museums and universities and the public. Um, and so I wanna ask you, uh, about informal education experiences. When you come to an exhibit like Pompeii, or if you visit Pompeii, or if you just do something outside of a classroom that's educational, it can really spark a lot of interest later in life. So my question to you is, have you had any impactful informal education experiences that have helped set you on your path? Yeah, definitely. My grandfather was very influential in a lot of this. Um, I grew up in a rural area. He was a mechanic who could probably fix anything. And at a very early age, he really uh, made sure that I participated in all of that. So I got to tinker, tear things apart, put them back together, see how they worked. And I took that with me forward through life. And I was in the military and I was stationed in Greece for about three and a half years. And during that time, I got to see all of the ruins, the science, the engineering, and how archaeologists were actually putting things back together. And that was greatly influencing on where I am today. Yeah, that is wonderful. I mean, uh, there are so many people who don't have access to museums and things like that, but having someone in their life that can push them to investigate and explore, that is wonderful. Um, I also wanna talk to you uh, about, um, you know, anyone studying a STEM field in college, 
Do you have any advice for anyone who might be interested in studying a STEM field? I most definitely do. Um, one of the things that I encounter when I teach a lot of early level courses that are very science oriented, I hear students say, I don't do science or I don't do math. And I immediately respond to them, can you change a light bulb? Um, that's basically the scientific method in a nutshell. Um, we use math every day in a lot of different ways. So my voice to them is basically, if you have a passion for it, if you like it, don't think that you can't do it. And always remember that behind every single science that we do, there's an art form. And so just because you are very interested in art doesn't mean that you can't cross that boundary directly into science. That's why we have STEAM. Yes, 100%. We actually have a wonderful STEAM gallery here to display artwork just like that at the Science Center. Thank you for saying that. Um, I, I think we're ready to start taking some questions from the audience. I'm seeing some great ones come in. Um, I'll kind of make my way through the list here. And as you're answering, I'll, I'll mute my microphone and I'll kind of be off on the side, okay? Sure. Uh, one of the first questions that we have here is, um, did they make wine out of other fruits as well? Or, or did they import it from other areas? So the question is specifically asking about things like date wine from Egypt. Sure, we, uh, they definitely imported a lot of different kinds of wines um, from many different regions. But one of the ones you asked if they made it out of any different kinds of fruit, they did make wines out of pears, um, out of pomegranates, basically anything that they could get to ferment, or if it was fruit that was already fermenting, they knew what was gonna happen. Um, even raisins, after they had dried the, the fruit, they would even make wine directly out of those. Very interesting. Um, just like lots of different ways of making wine and exploring that. One of the things that we've heard while re, like learning about this exhibit to be able to share is that there may have been a saying in Pompeii about come to Pompeii to eat the bread, but drink the wine from the town, one town over. Um, <laughs> so yes. um, yeah, let me, let me move on here to our second question. Uh, did they include other types of food into their breads like fruits and eggs? Uh, eggs, no, but they definitely included a lot of different kinds of fruits. One of the things is they had so many different kinds of breads and different kinds that you wouldn't necessarily think of as being breads. Many were like small biscuits or uh, cakes, those kinds of things. There are a lot of dried fruits that were included for specific holidays, for harvest festivals. Um, another thing is taking the spices and herbs that they would import from other regions and putting them in bread. In one instance, they even imported myrrh from Saudi Arabia and Egypt and put that into bread to have a very um, rich and potent kind of flavor that might be used in some of the religious uh, aspects. Well, that is fascinating. Um, Let's see here, the, this next question is actually one that we hear all the time in the exhibit. I'm very excited for you to answer this one. Was bread consumed with other items? So like butter or as part of a sandwich or was it just by itself? So most of the time, butter was not a part of the bread eating there, sad to say in my Dutch heritage. But um, one of the things that they did was they definitely consumed it with olive oils, with uh, the uh, defructum, the, the wine reduction sauce, um, a lot of different kinds of vinegars, cheeses. Um, so that was a, a prominent part of the diet, especially for breakfasts and a light lunch. Um, as far as how they would actually eat it as well, one of the things we have to think about is bread was also, like I said, an edible utensils. So they would use it almost like a trencher or to sop up other kinds of things. So we use plates today. And a lot of the time in certain households, plates were not available because they were expensive. And so they would actually use a good slice of bread as a plate. Uh, people are very interested in the bread. Um, so mm -hmm. one of the questions here is, uh, I'm excited for this one too, because I have no idea what the answer is. Uh, what was the cord used to hold the bread together? What was it made of? Uh, can you expand on that a little? We don't know. <laughs> Partly because of the fact that the bread that was found specifically in Pompeii, there's like, I think about a little over 80 loaves of bread that were found still in ovens. And keeping in mind that it was in the oven, it was high heat that was meant to burn off. And even with the uh, after effects of 
the pyroclastic flow and everything else, it probably burned off even more. So even if they were breads that were outside the oven in production, those would have burned off. Most, prom most people actually believe it was probably either a very low quality wool or possibly a very low quality kind of twine made of cotton. That is fascinating. Holy smokes. <laughs> I, I'm very excited because I can go upstairs and share all of this information with the staff. And now all of our guests will know this information all day long. Um, let me check the next one here. Okay, have you ever tried garum yourself? Um, and if you did, where did you uh, get what you sampled? And what would it be used on? Uh, I did try it. Um, when I was living in Greece, one of the things about this is garum sauce, like I said, it probably originated in Greece and it's still served there on quite a few different foods. Um, I had it on the island of Crete. I had it on roast pork and uh, it was basically uh, kind of like a paste that was covered over the top of the pork before it was roasted. It does have a very salty flavor. And if you think about a roast pork, it's went really well. It was almost like a rub on top of the, the pork. But it does have that super heavy mackerel flavor that comes through really quick and then goes back on to the, to the, uh, to the salt. So it's a, a different kind of combination of flavors that we wouldn't really expect to put together. Was, was there a reason that it was the consistency of like ketchup and not uh, what I normally think of with fish sauce as like a very um, liquidy substance? So garum is the one that is the first part that's taken off. And that garum is, uh, it, it, it almost is like a, the consistency of ketchup. But liquamen, which is uh, another fluid that comes from that as well, is the pure liquid. So you don't have that consistency. It's, it's almost like soy sauce. Hmm. Uh, the next question here is really interesting. Um, really, it switches gears a little bit. Um, how about what were the meal differences between the wealthy, political, uh, the politically powerful, the poor, and slaves? So slaves typically ate out of the kitchen um, that they were working in or were served out of. So depending on what was actually being fed to the more elite classes in Pompeii, they were eating what came back to the kitchen afterwards or during preparation. Um, in the poorer households, they ate the basics, the staples, uh, bread, uh, medium to maybe lower quality wines, poscas, cheeses, uh, you know, things that we would think of as just going to a fresh open market to get. At those higher class tables, that's where things got very interesting because depending on how closely related you were in politics or in family to those that were in charge in administration was how easy access you actually had to a lot of those delicacies that were coming in from other areas of the world. So as a, as a person of wealth, you had the ability to experience more of the world. Um, mm -hmm. What about um, nutritionally? Were, were they getting uh, the nutrition that they needed to be successful? Quite a lot, actually. The, the, one of the reasons that we have something today referred to as the Mediterranean diet that's considered to be very healthful is because of this region having such a wonderfully balanced and varied diet. This is the thing about nutrition. Um, you know, you can have a, a really good food staple in front of you, but if it's the only thing you eat all the time, it becomes problematic. And so having this very rich and varied diet from season to season and having all these products come in from outside made for a wonderful mix of nutrition. It's really interesting to consider the geography of Italy and to think about the, you know, obviously the volcano was a problem for Pompeii, but before that, it, it was part of why they were so successful with growing crops mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and then they, their access to the sea. Um, the fish sauce that was made, is that something that, are they trading with like other coastal communities or are they, make, are they making it themselves? Both, actually. Some of the best garum outside of Italy actually came from coastal regions of Spain. Um, it, it was considered to be some of the finest liquamen that existed in all of the world because it was made from a very specific mixture of tuna and mullet. 
Um, but they were trading this everywhere. Uh, as a matter of fact, in Turkey, there have been a couple of garum jars that have been found. And remember, where the Roman army goes, so goes the food. Yeah. And so, you know, they, they were very much in touch with the kinds of food that they were expecting to eat. And that's where you get into the we and the they for flavors as well, because the Roman army wasn't too keen on a lot of the food that they encountered in their travels. Yeah. Um, let's see here. The next question is about ceremonies. What about um, what types of foods were used in ritualistic or ceremonial purposes? So like marriages, appointments to some kind of office or funerals, things like that. Um, in, in the, think about like weddings or other kinds of celebratory uh, events. There were very fine breads that were made. Um, a lot of them were braided or had very fancy stamps on them or cuts. Um, a lot of the time as well, they made very nice cakes that were um, done in the bakeries. Uh, other kinds of food, you would find a lot of prepared dishes because remember Pompeii has a, a wealth of restaurants. And so people could contract to have catering done much the same way that we do today. Um, even some of the larger villas would hire uh, a lot of the restaurateurs or people who are known for certain kinds of food to come to the villas and cook in their kitchens. Um, for funerary aspects, we have a lot of the more basic kinds of foods, getting to the, the key elements of, of certain kinds of staples, like certain kinds of breads, coarse breads, um, things that didn't have a lot of fanciful kinds of flavors or things. So more of a staid kind of diet. Wow. Um, let's see here. How about uh, a great question. Did, did Pompeians brew beer? <laughs> Um, not necessarily. Uh, they, they had something that was close to it. It was almost like a very thick mead. Um, it was not something that many of us would sit down and enjoy in a, in a glass, a clear glass today. I'll put it that way because there was a lot of sediment in it. It's not something that was drunk by everyone. Uh, the majority of people who drank something that was equivalent to a beer or a mead would have actually been the lower classes and a lot of the Roman soldiers. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, how is meat kept fresh uh, for long distances? And for example, the giraffe plague that you talked about, um, they were not around Pompeii. So how do we keep that meat fresh on its journey? Well, fresh today is much different than fresh in the past. That's one of the big things to think about. But another thing is, is it is amazing that when you take a, a side of meat and coat it in honey, which is an antibacterial, and then pack it in a layer of salt, which is a preservative that kind of draws out some of that moisture, you get a very, very fine quality of meat in the end, and it can last for a long time. I guess uh, one of the best examples today would be uh, New York aged beef. It's aged over a period of time using almost the exact same kind of things that they were doing in transferring uh, meats back and forth. Um, seafoods are really interesting because from the coastal region to get up into the mountains in Italy, they would tie uh, these like big leather bags over the sides of donkeys, fill them with seawater and then keep the seafood alive as they were traveling to more distant areas. Well. I did not know that. That is very interesting. Um, uh, so, did they have to change out the water or anything like that, or they had to use salt water from the sea? I guess, right? So they would they they would basically bring closed containers or more leather sacks um, that had fresher water in them that the animals weren't living in. Mm -hmm. And so, if they had a very long distance to go, then they would change it out. But for the most part, the seafood uh, transferred across land pretty easily. How about um, the Pompeian diet compared to the rest of the Italian peninsula? Was it pretty similar? Was it better, maybe a little worse? I'm not sure. Uh, for the most part, it's pretty representative of a lot of the different regions. Now, even in the past, a lot of the different regions were um, very dependent on specific local delicacies or local produce and things like that. And so 
even today we see specializations throughout all of Italy. Every area is known for its own kind mm -hmm. of thing. Um, you know, some areas are specifically known for their bread. Some are known for specific wines. Some are for cheeses. And so it was the same thing in the past. But the overall staple diet was pretty much equivalent across the regions. Can you talk to us about what the typical caloric intake was and how many meals they would have consumed in a day? Sure. Um, they had basically three meals a day for the most part for the upper and middle classes. You would have a light breakfast, um, not very much calories there, maybe some cheese, a few cold meats that were left over, and some bread, wine, olives, those kinds of things. Um, a light lunch, also of breads, oils, maybe some uh, fresh vegetables, tomatoes, cheeses, um, different kinds of uh, gourds, the, things like that, peppers. But it was the dinner that was really the key component. And so that's where you got the majority of your calories. For the most part, their caloric intake was a little bit less than what we see today. Uh, for those that were of lower classes, a lot of the time they would have a quick breakfast and a lighter dinner. But a lot of the time they didn't really get to stop to have a lunch. Um, there wasn't necessarily the same thing as a lunch break today. You just got to keep on working through. Don't have a, a <laughs> wonderful hour to see a virtual educational session about the food of Pompeii, I guess, at that time. Um, so I, there's a good question here about um, I I illusion foods. So you reference a recipe where dormice, dormice are served on a bridge. How much did presentation influence elite Roman dining? And in your opinion, what impact do you feel it had on later medieval illusion foods? Oh, absolutely. Huge impact. Because one of the things you have to think about is the Roman Empire also extended up through, uh, through Europe and all the way into Great Britain. So when we see these kinds of illusion foods uh, being brought out, I mean, uh, it was the elegance of it. It was the, um, the audacity, the richness of being able to uh, waste or to um, go to that extent, not only on Caesar's table, but in every villa across the region. And so when you start to see that, just about in every culture of the world, when we start to see uh, a class difference where there is a, a very high elite or even a royal form, that's the idea, right? You can afford to make these audacious presentations of food. Sorry, Jesse, I think you muted, muted yourself. I, uh, thank you very much. I just said it's, <laughs> it's, it's great to show off with a nice dinner party. So Yes, it um, is. That's exactly it. Yeah. Um, other than breads, did they have any other starches that supplemented their diets? Um, a lot of root vegetables, um, a lot of, uh, like I said, pulses. Um, they had grains that they would create into porridges, those kinds of things. Um, not really a lot, because like I said, bread was the fun fundamental backbone. And if bread was not available, then they would try and turn to a lot of those other kinds of foods. But um, it's, it's almost impossible to imagine Roman society of any size, shape, or form at this time without bread being their main staple. The next question that's here, Dr. Williams, is very exciting to me because it starts off by saying, my students would like to know, which makes me think <laughs> that we have a wonderful classroom watching right now. And if so, I'm going to say hi to everybody. Um, my students would like to know if there are any texts or mention of bread tasting different from different regions, assuming yes. you're harvesting yeast in the same way you would uh, create a starter, a sourdough starter results in different tastes from area to area. So. Uh, do we know how it tasted beyond the grain being used for its preparation? Yes, we do, because that's one of the great things about Pliny the Elder. Now, the reason I keep bringing him up is because he was an interesting gentleman in his own right, as far as like writings and things like that, and observing the world around him. But he also died during the uh, Mount Vesuvius uh, explosion. He was trying to save a friend of his and, and ended up dying in the process. Um, but he writes quite a bit about the flavor 
of these kinds of things. Sometimes not in a good light, of course, because it's not something that he was used to for his palate. Um, he was not used to eating lower quality breads or things like that. But he does give us a really good idea of what breads tasted like, um, how much grain you would actually need from each region of the world to create a certain amount of bread. Um, and also what those grains tasted like on their own. Uh, so it's almost like a, a taste testing description from a, a food critic is a way to think about it for a lot of the different things that he wrote about. That kind of leads into the next question. Um, so uh, how do we know all the details regarding what was eaten by whom? So besides the remains found on the site, what, what are the sources of the evidence for all this? So we have a lot of ancient texts that do provide us with information. But the thing you really need to think about is that those were written by someone um, with an agenda, but also with a certain perspective. And so one of the great things about archeology span and one of the most fascinating things about Pompeii is we get this absolute snapshot, a pocket in time that lets us know exactly what was on everyone's table, what was in their larder, what was on their villa farm, um, what was being prepared in their kitchen. And so this really allows us a lot of um, great data to interpret exactly who was eating what, where, and when. Even the restaurants and the bars that we have within um, Pompeii have provided an amazing array of different information and different kinds of foods as well. Hmm. We have time for uh, just a few more questions, maybe one or two here. So I just wanna encourage everyone, if you have a question you're holding on to, go ahead and get it into the chat. Um, the next question here, are there any mysteries surrounding food of Pompeii and the Roman Empire, like the origin of a certain ingredient, something like that? Uh, there's a lot of mysteries still with foods. One of the biggest ones is knowing how they were actually preparing things. Um, dairy products are uh, a good mystery in a lot of ways. We know that cheeses were being made, but one of the things we don't know is a lot of the uh, methods that were being used, uh, the different mixtures of milks that were being used. Um, another thing that for a very long time was a, a good mystery had to do with uh, different kinds of meats being layered on top of each other, as Pliny refers to them. Uh, there was a, we, we think of today as the turducken, you know, the turkey, the duck, and the chicken. Um, that would not have been uncommon at any time, but it probably would have extended even further out in a lot of very elite kinds of uh, tables. So there's a lot of mystery as far as like what kinds of foods were being prepared in that manner. Um, it's also a huge mystery in a lot of different kinds of herbs. They refer to them in the names that they were using at that time, but we don't necessarily know the equivalent of what they were today. So this makes it a little interesting to use that experimental archaeology approach in using a lot of these recipes. What about, um, it's an interesting question, who's anthropological ideas have inspired your personal theoretical approach the most? Hmm. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's been a, a couple different um, aspects. One would be a very prominent anthropologist from the past. Um, that would have been Margaret Mead. She was a very strong woman with uh, an amazing uh, ability in science, but also an amazing ability to talk with those around her in uh, a very simplistic manner. And I really look at a lot of the things that she wrote and a lot of things that she did in different kinds of lectures and speeches. And I've tried to really pattern a lot of how I get information across on the, the, um, the ways that she did that as well. As far as another uh, really good influence on what I do today, as far as the, the in-depth science, I would have to say that there's a bioarchaeologist that many people probably know. She's very prominent 
and that would be Jane Bykstra. Um, she is someone who has uh, pushed the limits of what kinds of information we can get from archaeology looking at the human body. And I think that uh, was very influential in me thinking about um, the body as still a person that's able to give us a lot of information. Well, that's a great answer. Thank you. Um, uh, okay, the, the last question that I have listed here, it says, tell us about the most exciting, awe-inspiring event in your research or career. I feel like that's maybe a good place to stop right there. <laughs> um, you know, I, I've had quite a few different events in the field. I've had a few different events in the laboratory and those kinds of things. But one of the most awe-inspiring kinds of things I've ever experienced was um, in a couple of years, my first couple of years in the field doing archaeology, when actually I was an undergrad at UCF, um, there was an artifact that we had uncovered at uh, a site, Caracol in Belize. It was an ancient Maya site. And I was very excited about it. I really wanted to take a really good look at it. Uh, but it was covered in a powder that's called cinnabar. And cinnabar is actually a precursor to liquid mercury. And it just so happens that I happen to be allergic to mercury, <laughs> uh, any, any size, shape, or form of it. So um, my biggest thing was I was completely awe-inspired by it. And all I could say was, put it in the plastic bag, put it in the plastic bag, so I could actually take a look at it. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, thank you so much uh, for spending the time with us today. This was really incredibly fun. Um, let's see. Uh, I just want to let everybody know that this uh, will be available as a, a, just a video online soon. Um, you'll be able to watch this again or share with your friends so you can you know, spread the word. Our next talk will be with Dr. Sandra Wheeler on December 10th from 12 to 1, and we're going to focus on, on the human bodies uh, that were found at the site. And again, I just want to thank you so much, Dr. Williams. This was the most fun way I have spent my lunch hour in quite a long time. I had a really good time with this. I'm very excited to share this information with the staff. And I hope that we see everybody um, that joined us for this session here at the Science Center. Thank you very much for your time. Oh, thank you. All right. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Um, and feel free to email into the Science Center. If you have any additional questions, we'd love to get back to you. And again, that link for students uh, that need uh, credit, it's gonna be in the Q&A. You can access it right now. Thank you very much, everybody.